Hi everyone, I'm Pranoti, host of Under the Microscope. This series is brought to you by the Real Scientists Nano team. Our goal is to provide a platform where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, every week we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials or nanoscience, who tweets from the Real Scientists Nano Twitter account, which is realsci underscore nano. My name is Pranati and I am uh, your host of Under the Microscope podcast series. And today we have with us Susie Seibt, who is a beamline scientist at the Australian Synchrotron, uh, ANSTO. And I honestly did not know that there are synchrotrons in Australia. That's a new thing for me. So enough about that. Uh, Susie, based out of Melbourne. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I want to ask you so many questions after the short podcast recording. There are so many questions I have for you. But let's start with um, getting to know your science journey so far. So how did you end up in Melbourne being a beamline scientist uh, at the Science Donut? And for people who are just listening to the long podcast, (laughs) if you want to know what a Science Donut is, refer to the short podcast or stay with us on the long podcast. Okay, Susie, there you go. (laughs) Right. So I call my science journey the Great March East, which for German is a very weird thing to say. <laughs> yeah. Let's start, let's start at the basics. So I um, was a scientist probably as long as I can remember, and my parents will tell you that, because I could never stop asking why, and I had to always know something. So far that my parents ran out of ideas and my dad just made up stuff, which is not helpful, but funny. Anyway, I studied um, chemistry, actually polymer science, um, in a really small town in Bavaria called Bayreuth. Um, classical music fans know that um, from Wagner. So it's the city of Wagner. It's a city in Germany, in Australia. Yeah. It's, it's, yep. Ah, okay. So, so, <laughs> so yeah, Bayreuth in Germany, if you read it as an English speaking person, not Beirut in Lebanon. Um, yeah, and during the first year of my PhD, so I did my bachelor's there, I did my master's there, as you do in Germany, and then I started my PhD. And during the first year, my supervisor gave me the chance to do a three month stay funded by the DAAD in Melbourne, Australia, because he had a collaboration there. And um, my topic was, you know, quite fitting for it. So I went there and I really enjoyed that. Fortunately for me, um, during the time, my supervisor was also on sabbatical in Australia and um, was there to set up a so-called DAAD thematic network um, in polymer science, actually. And part of that was creating a so-called joint PhD. So basically, you spend half your time in Germany, half your time in Australia, and in the end, graduate from both universities. And because I was already there, had a really great time and did apparently some really nice research. Um, he offered me to do that. Saying that he offered me to do that is he invited me out for dinner. We had a glass of red wine. And then he asked if I'm going to do it while it was like a 35 degree night in Melbourne. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And so we did it, you know. And uh, yeah, <laughs> doesn't need much convincing when you have that setting. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I spent basically my PhD flying back and forth between Germany and Australia explaining one one topic of you know my PhD to the other supervisor in fact because my German supervisor was very big in you know Netflix and x-ray scattering and then my Australian supervisor really big into the nano world and they were very far apart from each other as I learned but that's okay I combined them got a PhD out of it it was great after that I so during that I kind of realized that life in Australia suits me better than in Germany and you know lived there for a long time so Maybe it was time for a change. So I moved on to be the so-called gateway office manager for my German university, Uni Bayreuth, at, based at the Uni Melbourne, um, and managed their international affairs in Australia and New Zealand. So I basically set up you know, collaborations with unis. I strengthened the connections. I helped them write funding grants and applications um, for international joint, joint projects. Mm-hmm. Um, before I moved on to do a postdoc fellowship 
um, in renewable energies at RMIT University. So mm -hmm. we're slowly making our way further east within Melbourne. And then from there, I got headhunted to be a beamline scientist, mainly because I used to beamline during my PhD and the team, apparently, I left a really good impression with them. So we stayed in contact afterwards and, you know, they we got along really well and they had a position open and then they were like, hey, how about you? And I was like, hey, I what? like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up at a science donut and here uh I am. That is so cool. That sounds so, so cool. That's amazing. Wow. That is that is so cool. Ah, I'm so happy for you. Um, so, uh, Susie, you spoke a little bit about your research, uh, your current research at the Beamline in the short podcast. But what I would like to understand from you is where does your current research fit in this big picture of materials or nanoscience? Because it's quite a broad field. Yeah, it's also quite interesting because as a beamline scientist, you don't really do a lot of like your own research anymore. So I don't stand in a lab anymore every day. Mm -hmm. I stand at the beamline almost every day. But yeah, generally small angle X-ray scattering or sucks, as you know, if you followed Brian Paul through his week, um, is one of the most powerful characterization techniques when it comes to materials and nanoscience. So it's it's widely used on lab bench instrument, but like particularly beamlines, we do most of our work in the materials and nanoscience world, actually. Um, I used it during most of my career to date and for very fundamental research. So I come from, as I said, physical chemistry, polymer science background. I looked into reaction kinetics, which is a lot of maths, apparently. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, as a part of my position as a beamline scientist, I can now be an active part in a lot of research project and some of which of them like some of them are very very applied so they're you know real world application like one of them recently got a eureka science prize here which is one of the most prestigious prizes here um for research into malaria drug digestion and how to deliver it through you know breast milk or in milk for infants in africa mm -hmm. also called the malaria milkshake because you know we're all about the taglines and analogies Right. And it's really it's <laughs> and it's all nanoscience, right? It all comes down to lipases in in milk, how they form like crystalline lattice. And it's it's just amazing. So basically, our instrument sucks the technique can look at particles between the range of zero point five and five hundred nanometers, which is everything nano. And we look at literally everything. So we look at you know chemist material like chemistry materials, physics, biology, the whole, everything in between. We look, you know, at engineering, like really engineering based topics, we have to say, and, and applied materials. And the whole world of nano and material science is literally at our doorstep. So if you have anything in that range, I'm pretty sure we can measure it. That is, that is really broad. And SACS, just for people who are, who are not aware of what the acronym stands for, could you tell us what it stands for? Everything. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I know we have we have acronyms for everything. You will figure that out during my week on the Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, SUX stands for small angle X-ray scattering. Um, our beamline is called SUX VAX, so it stands for SUX and VAX, which is small and wide angle X-ray scattering. So we can go even actually we can go even um, smaller than 0 0.5 nanometers if we push it in a little bit higher than 500. But that's our comfortable range. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it sounds like a plot for our instrument, but it's really amazing. It's so versatile because um, if you will see, as you will see, like a lot of other beam lines are very specific in the samples that they can handle. Like they have to be powders or they have to be on substrates, you know, coated on substrates or something. And we can literally do almost anything possible in this world. We can do gas, we can do liquid, we can do solid, we can do powders, gels, you know, whatever. If flowing or stopped in motion, you know, so solids in vacuum when they're compatible or in air, it's like absolutely nuts what we do. Wow, that is so cool. We also had a scientist uh, who, I think her name was Marjorie, I don't remember exactly, but she was looking at water. So she wanted to go to a beam line to look at how the water crystallizes and stuff. Can you do that as well? Yeah. <gasps> oh my God, that is so cool. Yeah. 
That is so cool. Awesome. 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 Okay. 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 That sounds good. So now I have a very uh, mean question for you, Susie. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is um, out of all the different research projects that you have been part of or you are part of now, can you pick one research project, the one that you're most proud of or the most fun or quirky one or had whatever you pick one and explain it to us in simple words in the section we call in other words sure so i think um one of the ones that i'm particularly proud of is when we when i adapted super 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 fast nanoparticle synthesis and reaction into microfluidics and then looked at not only like how these particles grow but also how they start to nucleate in nanosecond resolution so yeah, it's like it's absolutely crazy because it pushes the limits of everything that was available at the time and, you know, in technique of analysis as well as in how you present the sample and then also the adapted synthesis, obviously. So quantum dots are an insane material. I mean, by now everyone knows them from the QLED that you probably have at home or you admire in the shops if you can't afford it. Mm -hmm. um, but they help, um, you know, <laughs> Yeah. They, if you optimize them, it basically makes it makes the world a brighter place, which is hilarious because our our um our new beam lines are built under a program program called Bright. So we make the world a brighter place as always. But you know, it makes the world a brighter place. It makes your <laughs> it makes your smartphones like the smartphone screen brighter, it makes QLEDs possible, you know, it makes biosensors more ac accurate. It's like it's a great material and it is very, very important for the chemists behind that and the physicists and the engineers who implement them, that these materials are very precise in their size and very precise in their properties. And the more you know about the properties, the easier it becomes to implement them and the cheaper it becomes to produce this in a mass scale, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, in understanding the reactions, understanding the fundamentals of the synthesis is just the basis of everything really, you know, it's, Casus knuctus, as we say in German. Anyway, um, <laughs> so what happens is if you have these materials, they're often done in, like they're produced in a batch synthesis and it's really under crazy conditions. So you heat up, you know, your solution with your precursors to like 300 degrees or something, like everything from 100 to 300 degrees. And then you inject an initiator and then literally in the moment that one liquid hits the other, you can't even see it with your eyes, but all you see is a magic color change. And that's it. That's your particles. Done. You know? And like, the thing is, if you do this reaction, how do you even take aliquots out of that to, to look at what's happening during that reaction? So it's so fast, it's like, it's impossible. Yeah. And I managed to get, you know, a few of those reactions adapted to microfluidics and looked at them at the synchrotron and also with other methods like confocal microscopy, how these particles start to nucleate and grow. Microfluidics is pristine for that because you can you know, convert a time axis to a distance axis along a channel. So if you have continuous flow, you know, in, in small channels, mm -hmm. that's how it is. And so I looked at, you know, all the stages of the reaction, nanosecond resolution, how these particles nucleate and grow and how you can, you know, tweak the little screws to make it better or worse. And then, um, you know, what screw does what also, that's very important. So yeah, without, you know, wasting like 10,000 batch reactions, which are all done in a different environment, you know, the beaker is maybe not as clean or whatever, and it all, it all changes. So it is absolutely insane. And I think this is probably the one I'm most proud of. That is- Eating my own horn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 this is what this is what we want. This is what this is what this uh, question is for. To, this is where you brag about the research project that you're most proud of, so to say. But oh wow, that sounds because I know how difficult it is to uh, to be able to visualize it or even tweak it at a nanoscale. Uh, the nucleation it happens like this. Yeah. Within a nanosecond. Oh, oh my God, that is so cool. Do you have pictures? <laughs> I will post some pictures of this. Do you have I like a video to. or something? I do also have videos. <laughs> that sounds so cool. Oh my God, that is so cool. That is so cool. Awesome. Cannot wait to watch that video. Um, <laughs> that sounds really cool. Can you share that video? Can I add it in the video? 
in this video? <laughs> um, I think the, the best imagery, I'm not even sure if I made it a video or not, but the best thing that I did with um, having it on a confocal microscope, it's not sucks for once, unfortunately, but it's, it's cool because it's an optical method, right? It's, yeah, it's an optical confocal so I, microscopes yeah. are really cool. I love them. Oh. I love them so much. Anyway, so I did it. Um, I did. I imaged the whole channel because the reaction it is spread out over um, a distance along the channel, but it's static even though it's in flow mm -hmm. because you know, like the time scales are static at several positions along the channel. Um, and I imaged the whole channel, and you can see, you know, because these quantum dots they have the awesome feature that they're fluorescent when they grow and they change in fluorescence as they grow along. Mm -hmm. um, and I imaged it, and you can see like. The whole like how I hydrodynamically focused my reaction and where it's onset and then it gains an in intensity and shifts in in um, spectra how they grow along the channel in 3D. So oh, it's awesome. literally like you you're like on a roller coaster ride along your reaction, which is absolutely insane. Oh, that sounds so amazing! Oh my god, that is so cool. Oh, <laughs> and it looks like a smiley face, which is the best part. <laughs> so. Now I have to see the video and put it in this video if that's possible. Please, I need to see that now. Oh my God, that sounds really, really cool. Wow, wow. Every answer you're giving, it's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, you want to do it, hey? <laughs> that is so cool. That is so cool. So, I mean, Susie, after speaking with you for this short amount of time already, I have I have the feeling that you le you really enjoy the research. Uh, you you do enjoy the research, but there is there are other aspects to being a scientist and to be a beam scientist, um, beamline scientist. Um, so what else do you enjoy other than the research itself, like getting your hands dirty, sort of a thing? Not really metaphorically because we are all safe and stuff what else do you enjoy about being a scientist i um actually really enjoy science communication so as i said in the shorter podcast version already i'm really big on science communication i have a science youtube channel check it out um, i will talk about this <laughs> i'll talk about this on sunday a lot it's called helium like helium but with an s because we're females and it's great um and I love the, like, what I love about it is the curiosity and the interest then you can spark in other people. Like, there's this moment when you break down a really, really focused and, you know, like, science lingo, like, topic to the bare minimum that you need accurately to understand it. Mm -hmm. And it opens people's eyes and then they get curious and then they ask you questions like, but why is that? And how does that work? And, you know, oh, can you show me the molecule? I don't understand, but you know, you show them differences and then it like, it clicks and it's, they get really into it. They're like children. And mm. this is what I love because it comes down to being a child. Like we're all in a children, you know, we all wanted to play with the sand castles in the sandbox and, you know, eat the sand because it tastes different. Anyway, I might've done that. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. If you make an effort as a scientist to, you know, reach out to the public and explain it in a way that it's approachable and, and you know, really applicable to them and they, they understand it, it makes conversations happen and it, it sparks an enthusiasm about science that is really infectious. Like they go on and they talk to, you know, their families about it. And they're like, oh, today I learned this. And it's actually really simple, you know, and like, and you sit there and this is what it should be. Like, it, this is like science is for everyone. It's everywhere. It's not a scary topic. It is just the world, you know, and the world is fascinating. It's a fascinating place. So I love that. And I love this moment, particularly in children. So I do a lot of science outreach also in schools, particularly the German ones around here because I'm German. And when they get their hands dirty, literally, because I do like little lab experiments, you know, like edible water bottles, my God, it blew their minds. Just, you know, just having like a little polymer film that is edible and encapsulating water of different colors and then having like bubble tea, but like made yourself, we call them edible water bottles, blew their mind. It's the easiest reaction, you know. Excellent. And it's it's sparks a curiosity and it takes away this bias that we're having. And I feel like this is what we all should do. We break the bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Edible water bottles. It's not just for the kids. I also want those. And I'm also fascinated by those. 
<laughs> you know, the, they're the greatest child's birthday party trick, apparently. Like all the mums afterwards contacted me. So the kids go home, right? And they get like their little plastic bag with the edible water bottles, like, mommy, look at this. And they contact me and they're like, can you do this with apple juice and orange juice and all the juice? And I'm like, sure. And they're like, how? Tell me how. Tell me what I need. Tell me, can you come here? Can you do this? Can I hire you? And I'm like, I'm not a clown, but yes. Yeah, you can get you can get booked for these kinds of things at like kids events, you know. Um, I think uh, wasn't it like 80s or something? You used to have like a magician at the kids' party, and now we have Dr. Exactly. Susie, uh, who is coming with edible water bottles. Uh, <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, that's, that that's you're absolutely right. We are all kids. Um, at the, at the heart and if we can um, entice that kid or in some way in in people and being like see how cool this is and that's they're like what why what what edible what about what uh, <laughs> that is the perfect way of going about it and I'm glad that you enjoy the um, the science outreach part what was the channel called again Su- Susie Celia <laughs> Celium, like helium with an S. Celium. Oh, celium. Ah, now I get it. <laughs> like the second element in the periodic table, but with an additional S. Which is also funny because it's my initials, so, you know, it just, it's really makes sense. You know? It just makes, it, it just fits. Celium. Celium. Everyone go subscribe to celium. Um. <laughs> It sounds to me that you have gathered a lot of experience uh, so far. I'm not calling you old. I'm just saying that you have lots of experience. Also, wise, right? Very wise. <laughs> so wisdomous. Oh, my God. Um, so what, what advice would you give uh, yourself uh, if you were starting out your journey, science journey today? Or what advice would you give to other budding scientists um, based on what you know now? Yeah, I think it is a bit following on from, you know, what we just talked about. I think what is very important as a scientist is to find something, find the reason why you became a scientist and the passion why you stuck to it for, you know, whatever period you're at right now. Um, because, the, and, and you have to try and hold on to this and try to spread that enthusiasm in other people, you know, particularly in non-scientists around you, I feel like. Yeah. Because the thing is, I always, I was always told, you only know that you understood something when you can explain it to someone else, right? right? So you only know that you're passionate about something when you can spark this interest in someone else. So if you listen to me talk about my topics, I can talk about this forever, you know. But but the way I talk about it often gets the reaction of, oh my god, that's so cool, and I'm like, yes, and I don't make it dry because I'm really passionate about it, and that's what I do. And the, I, I find this very important because times in science, particularly in academia and research, which you spend a lot of time with when you study, can get really tough. And particularly at the moment, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of criticism on scientists and what, you know, why we exist, <laughs> why why we want to stand in the spotlight, which we really not often do. But, you know, it, it can get really tough and can get really draining. So it is very important to remember why you went down that path and spent so much time with it and, you know, finding that spark of curiosity and passion for science also for yourself and then for everyone else. Because, you know, sometimes when you take yourself out of the picture and look at what you do, it is really fascinating. And, you know, it never ends because the world and the universe is just endlessly fascinating. So it just, you know, where do we even go from here? (laughs) That is correct. That is five thousand options. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Yeah, you are absolutely right. You, it's it's good to be reminded of why we went on this path and have that moments of like just take a pause and being like, why did I decide to become a scientist? Yes, because I love science and science is amazing. Even if the world is burning, it's fine because science is cool. And being in the lab, analyzing my results or writing that paper is what makes me happy. And that's why I'm doing it. Um, Sometimes it's also good to go back to like being a child, you know, like the other day I made a video about because it was Easter, you know, for the Christian celebrating people amongst us. us, But we all take a free holiday. So 
so be it, you know? So it was Easter and we die E6. Makes no sense, but we do it anyway. And then there are some real cool tips to like do that with just things you have at home. And that's like something that every child does, you know, and you can explain meanwhile the science of it. And it's so fascinating why you have to put vinegar in there. You know, if you put it in vinegar overnight, you can like dissolve the shell and make a bouncy egg and things like that. It's just so cool. It is literally, and you do that with eggs in your kitchen and you're like, this is like the coolest thing. And it's literally in my fridge downstairs. So it's so cool. Oh my God. It's so cool. <laughs> I feel like if you are not already doing this, maybe you can consider this as your side hustle. Uh, being um, a scientist at the kids' birthday parties or something to get them like edible water bottles there are the bouncy eggs there's like so many things if you're not it's already... better than magic because it's real <laughs> it's real it is so real and this is a great way to communicate science and also entertain the kids and like oh my god that is so cool can i hire you for my birthday party anytime <laughs> <laughs> you just want edible water bottles but i'll make them for you Yes, edible water bottles. Yes, please. I want to know the science behind it. And I will just sit there with all my friends and be like, oh, my God, this is so cool. Tell us more. Tell us more. And why and what? And uh, hmm. um, would totally do that. I, I can totally do that. And that is one of the reasons why I started this podcast, because I was like, I have so many questions. And the only way to get those questions answered is to ask the experts and I'm going to ask them all kinds of questions. And this is, so actually this podcast is for me, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but you're sharing it with the world, which is you know, yeah, the true. greatest approach. That is, a, that is a good point. Yes, that is true. Um, Susie, um, it all sounds like your science experience so far has been like amazing and it's all like winning, 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 everything, everything just worked out. And I'm sure there were points where you were like, oh, I wish I had this. I wish things were different. I wish I had this coffee machine or whatever. So for example, um, so if you have uh, three wishes to improve your research experience, uh, what would you ask for? And I'm not promising anything here. <laughs> it depends more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine I have an endless amount of coffee available for me now at work no um on a serious note I think um the uh, never never ending topic it seems um is to achieve or make an effort see more effort in achieving gender balance so obviously and not just gender balance but also equity and equity in every level because it is so frustrating, you know, when you don't have role models in STEM careers that go beyond the entry level. And it is so crushing because so many industries and so many organizations are behind on this and they don't even see it. Why? Because their leadership board is not in that problem. You know, mm -hmm. they don't have that problem. They're not in that position. So they don't even see it. And just the awareness of it helps to, you know, make an effort to increase this. And I had many many issues in my life where I was you know downgraded and you know reduced to being female being German blonde blue-eyed and all the things that come with that I can tell you all about that not on podcast <laughs> but yes it's very frustrating and it is very you know it fosters an imposter syndrome in all of us because once you get successful you always have this oh you should just get hired because she's the quarter female and it's just not right we are excellent scientists, we are excellent science, science communicators, we are excellent researchers and excellent beamline scientists, and we all do our bit, we all pull our load, and we all do excellent work, so, you know, there needs to be an effort for that. Second thing, I guess, is, um, you know, following on from that also, to have a better funding structure. I mean, I'm in Australia now. Australia has a lot less funding than Germany for science, which is really sad. And, you know, we are just about to have another election. So who knows what comes out of this? Um, but I don't want to go political. But the thing about it is that what if the last two years told us anything is that we need an open ear and funding for science because it is essential for our survival on this planet. It is essential for our health. It is essential for our technology. It's everything. And I feel like governments don't put enough emphasis on this and this is a global phenomenon um, and they don't see and validate the importance and the impact of scientific research. And I feel like 
it doesn't mean that scientists have to go into politics and it doesn't mean that politics have to be, you know, politicians have to be all scientists or something, but just learning from each other and with each other and appreciating that is essential. And particularly for early career researchers is crippling if you see what hoops they have to jump through to go anywhere and then they leave academia and they're excellent researchers and scientists and you just, you know, you don't even know. It's just soul crushing in a bit. Anyway, on a brighter note, I think, last wish, the world would be a better place if, particularly in science, everyone would be a little bit more together and a little bit less against each other. There's an endless amount of, you know, competitiveness and entitlement floating around. And I feel like the world is a better place. And I learned this through the hard way and the easy way when people are just working together and communicating this clearly. And the STEM world would be so much further ahead if people would just start working together more because we're all on the same boat called this Mother Earth, you know. So really, there's no need for the competitiveness. It leads on from the second part because if funding makes it competitive, you know, this is what you get. But it is toxic and it really, it needs to stop because we're just, you know, we're all just trying to make the world a better place in yeah. one way or the other. So, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All three of your wishes are extremely um, valid uh, for sure and I recently heard this podcast uh, regarding your first wish uh, I have to read that article but I heard the podcast um, <clears throat> with the writers of this article which was titled or which is titled stop telling women they have imposter syndrome yes it's the structures that make people feel, make women feel that they have imposter syndrome. They yeah. are the, the structures and the society that we live in. That's what is, stop telling people they have imposter syndrome. Fix yourselves, guys. It's not us, it's you. Yeah. Oh. 100% I could not agree more. Oh my God, that is oh, un unbelievable. And also, the, the, the funding, of course, it has to be better. I'm sorry, but it has to be better. You cannot, you just, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a good idea to keep cutting down the funding, and it's not a good idea to make scientists uh, compete with each other uh, for funding. Yes, healthy competition is good, of course. You need healthy competition, but not at the... Uh, cost of forgetting at the end of the day we are all humans and we are all living on one planet um, so let's try not to do that but I, I, I hope like oh actually all three wishes of yours are realistic um, <laughs> well let's hope so you know <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm hoping that I'm, I am I'm, a scientist <laughs> after all so I don't have unrealistic wishes <laughs> Of course, of course. Although I always, I always wanted a unicorn. So if you have a unicorn available, I'll take that too. Let me get back to you on that one. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm a realist usually, and some people see me as a pessimist as well. But when it comes to your wishes, I am quite optimistic that we are hopefully working towards a more diverse um, diversity in academia, diversity and inclusion. In academia, and hopefully the funding uh, structure will also change in parts of the world, some somehow, somewhere. Um, and the healthy competition, I mean, if we have active researchers like you who are aware of this, uh, I'm sure we will get there. Well, we'll it's already a better place now that we met, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Could not agree more. Could not agree more. Susie, this has been so wonderful. Oh my God, I love you and I love the conversation. Um, but before I let you go, I have one last question for you. And that is, what are your learnings from the current times that we are living in, uh, uh, the new era uh, that kicked started in early 2020 and i'm not going to say use the p word or the c word but you know what i'm talking about i know what you're talking about and i think my biggest learnings are that science is essential mm -hmm. and uh, you know i feel like people got a little bit of a glimpse into science now which is good and bad you know it has its bads but 
Mm-hmm. I feel like it, it's good that it got a little bit more awareness, you know, that there's science and it is here to save our days, which is what we do, you know, the heroes of the world, um, like Mario, you know, and Luigi. Anyway, so <laughs> that's that. And then also, I think we all got a chance to, um, you know, even though it was a very stressful time in one way or the other, um, it still is, um, even more so now, I feel like. But we all had a chance to take a step back and really rethink our values and rethink the things that are really essential to us and what make us happy and i feel like that moving on from that we should try to implement and hold on to that you know i mean science for once but flexible working arrangements or you know like work-life balance having pets having children have you know partners all of this alive (laughs) it's just you know it's really I, i find this really really inspiring to see how many people now try to change their work attitude to accommodate more what makes them happy and what makes their life better because this is what they spend their life in lockdown with and really you know if if we take something good from it let it be that yeah that is very very kind and that is very nice oh you're so like i I want to hang out (laughs) with you so much oh my god you're so cool Thank you very much for speaking with me and really... Thank you for having me. (laughs) (laughs) It has been so much fun. Oh, my God. And looking forward to having you on Real Scientist Nano. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This is Pranoti, host of Under the Microscope. To know more about us, visit our website, thesciencetalk.com, and follow us on Twitter at realsci underscore nano.